Workers at the damaged Fukushima nuclear plant moved unused fuel out of a reactor building last week. Now they're moving on to a more dangerous task. They're set to start on Tuesday, the removal of highly radioactive used fuel. Tokyo Electric Power Company workers on Friday completed the transfer of a cask containing 22 assemblies of unused fuel rods. They moved it from the storage pool of the number four reactor building to another pool nearby. Officials said they encountered no problems, but they said sand in the pool reduced visibility. They plan to pump the pool clear of particles for the next operation. They'll start on Tuesday moving 1,331 assemblies of spent fuel rods. That's the vast majority of fuel remaining in the pool, and they'll be taking extra care with the highly radioactive material. This will mark the first time spent nuclear fuel has been removed from a reactor building since the plant was damaged in March 2011 by the earthquake and tsunami. A team from the International Atomic Energy Agency is to inspect the decommissioning process at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Members are gathering information in Tokyo before heading to the complex on Wednesday. The 19-member team includes experts in reactor decommissioning and radioactivity. The second visit by the team since April is scheduled to run until Wednesday of next week. Team leader Juan Carlos Lentijo said he wants to share with the world what they learned from the Fukushima case. Lentijo added that they will pay particular attention to the way radioactive water is handled at the facility. They will also assess the safety of the effort to remove nuclear fuel from the number four reactor building. UN nuclear experts have arrived in Japan to assess the decommissioning of the wrecked Fukushima nuclear power plant. The experts will also review the operator's progress in removing fuel rods from a destroyed reactor building and minimizing leaks of contaminated water. A team of 19 experts from the International Atomic Energy Agency and other bodies will tour the plant on Tuesday and evaluate TEPCO's fuel extraction process at the number four reactor and its handling of contaminated water. It concludes its review on December the 4th. This is the IAEA's second review of Japan's plans for decommissioning. During its last review in April, the agency was critical of the cleanup effort, saying the plan had an unrealistic time frame and calling for a comprehensive approach to handling contaminated water. The Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, 220 kilometers north of Tokyo, was wrecked by the huge earthquake and tsunami in March 2011.
of a leak of highly radioactive water at Japan's. The Japanese government, for the first time, Japan's nuclear safety agency says highly radioactive groundwater could use an estimate of how much contaminant. What's the situation like in Fukushima now? Your guess is as good as mine, in fact. Nobody's really sure about it. Thing is, they're doing the right thing. Are they? Thing is, the wrong guy is doing it at a bad time. <laughs> That's the problem. Um, Japanese <laughs> Prime Minister Shinzo Abe actually mm -hmm. said that, um, you know, I think prior to uh, winning the Olympics bid, he said that he has all this uh, nuclear crisis under control, after which, um, a few days, TEPCO said, in fact, it wasn't under control. With your expertise in looking at the situation, is it under control? I don't think so, but quite right to be doing something, but not Tokyo Electric, somebody more qualified and with more competence. Well, learning from history, couldn't they, I don't know what they did in Three Miles or Chernobyl, but whatever that they did there, couldn't the Japanese government just follow suit? If it comes to Chernobyl, they chose to um, utilize concrete rather mm -hmm. than water because it was just too much to all uh, be handling with water. Why were they avoiding using concrete? Think about the case that Japanese folks are uh, pouring a whole bunch of concrete and cement onto their plants. They'll be looking real ugly because that will mean the end of nuclear industry. Oh. Pouring water seems more decent, mm -hmm. okay? Because everybody's doing it. Everybody tends to pour water to cool it down so that they look to be working like normal. So basically everyone in Japan, mm -hmm. everyone around Japan, everyone in the world, we have to be on our toes for the next however many years that this would take. It's not many years, many decades, that's what I'm saying. They're talking about a year and a half, 18 months, but that's a very unplausible case that there's no external, no instant, no uh, slippage because they're trying to pull out 1800 fuel bundles, it's not just one rod, it's about 100 rod. rods put together, they call it bundle or assembly. So that's where everybody or every knowledgeable scientist and engineers get really scared about this. Could I be eating my, uh, my seafood I, and fish? And... I would say that it should be safe enough from the scientific point of view, okay? But again, this is not a matter of science, this is a matter of public trust. Once you lost the public trust, science doesn't come into play. They don't trust it. I don't trust in myself either. So I don't need any fish. I don't like it to start with, but I tend to be staying away from it. Like you said, it's unprecedented and uh, we don't exactly. know what mm -hmm. we're supposed to expect out of this. And right. All right, we'll uh, continue the discussion sure downstairs. Thing. Thank all you. Right, no problem. of three reactors at Japan's Fukushima nuclear power plant may have happened more than two years ago, but the disaster remains a giant, unresolved mess to this day. They could actually affect the process as well. Right? Exactly. Doing something. A little late, but very late. Nobody on the planet has done this before. We should be thinking about some 30 to 40, even 50 years, half a century, for them to be done in the safe way. And renewables? Human rights expert says he's concerned about a Japanese government bill to protect state secrets. He says it poses a threat to transparency and people who leak information. UN Special Rapporteur Frank LaRue says the bill appears to establish vague grounds for deciding what information to keep secret. He warns it could undermine democratic governance by threatening transparency, and he says it endangers whistleblowers and journalists who report on state secrets.
LaRue also warns the bill makes no reference to an independent authority to check government decisions on what information to keep secret. He's asking Japanese leaders for more details. <laughs> Li Qingzhi is a chef from China. He came to Japan to learn the art of Japanese cuisine thanks to a government training program run by the Japan International Technical Cooperation Organization, or JITCO. But he didn't head to a kitchen. He shows me where he did go, the hills of Japan, where he says he was assigned hard manual labor by a private fixture-making company clearing trash, cutting trees and scrap metal. Lee says he was paid minimum wage in order to work overtime. His timesheets show in one month he worked nearly every single day, a total of 236 hours of overtime in that one month, all unpaid, he says. I was so tired and wanted to rest, says Lee, but I thought if I keep working hard, I can get what I want. When he asked to be paid for the overtime, he says, his company fired him. The company hasn't responded to CNN's request for comment on the allegations. It is actually like slavery. Lila Abiko is Lee's attorney and helping him sue his Japanese employer. She says Lee's case is just one of thousands of mostly unskilled Chinese workers who come to Japan on the promise of job training and good pay under a government program that partners with private industry. In reality, it is used to used to uh, exploit cheap labor from China. So, so there's far difference between purpose and the reality. In the case of Jiang Xiaodong from China, investigators are looking into whether his job led to his death. Jiang's attorney says the trainee died of acute heart failure. He was 31. Japan's government is investigating the case as death by overwork and expected to make a ruling soon. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Migrants says the program needs to be discontinued because in some cases it may amount to slavery. Lee says he is fighting his case in court, not just for his pay, but for other trainees. We should have the same rights as the Japanese, says Lee. JITCO, which operates the government program, would not speak to CNN on camera, but did send over this statement on paper and says that it is aware that there are some problems with some companies not following the rules of the program and says that as of July 1st, it has amended its program in hopes of offering more protection to foreign workers and preventing future problems. The new U.S. ambassador to Japan says her country will continue supporting the reconstruction of areas devastated by the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. Caroline Kennedy is currently on a tour of the northeastern uh, of northeastern Japan. That is, NHK World's Junio Tsumoto reports on her visit and the high expectations her appointment has generated. Caroline Kennedy is spending two days in the northeast seeing how communities are recovering from the 2011 disaster. She went to a school in Ishinomaki, where American Taylor Anderson worked as an assistant English teacher. Anderson died when the tsunami hit the city. Her parents donated books to schools in the region. And I know this is a very special place. Study hard and hopefully to come and visit America and make friends. Kennedy is an author and lawyer. She was born in 1957. She was five years old when her father was assassinated. Kennedy appeared in a video message to the Japanese people before arriving to assume her post. I'm Caroline Kennedy. I'm fortunate to have studied Japanese history and culture and to have visited your beautiful country. She spoke about traveling to Hiroshima and said it compelled her to hope for world peace. And she referred to her honeymoon in Kyoto and Nara. She said that's where she realized the people of Japan and the United States share common values. Japanese have welcomed Kennedy enthusiastically. Hundreds lined the streets last week when she rode a horse-drawn carriage to the Imperial Palace to meet the Emperor.
President Kennedy's daughter is serving as ambassador. I respect her as a woman. This expert suggests the ambassador may have a positive impact on Japanese society by promoting women's issues. One of the issues that Japan as a society is facing is the empowerment of women. And we know that our population is uh, declining. So we have to engage the half of the population to the society. And her role, being a first um, uh, female ambassador uh, to Japan, would have a, a positive effect on that uh, 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 issue. But some have taken a negative view of Kennedy's resume. They wonder if she has the diplomatic skills needed for her new job. The Japan-U.S. alliance is complex and includes many sensitive issues such as the status of American military bases in Okinawa. Plus, Japan's relations with neighboring countries such as China and South Korea have soured because of territorial disputes. But Professor Nakayama says Kennedy's direct channel to President Obama may help her make up for lack of experience. She could take up, of the, take up the phone and probably uh, the President of the United States, President Obama, would directly answer. So in that respect, uh, I think it would, uh, uh, her presence would have a, a positive influence in, in, in Japan and the role she could play uh, in the U.S.-Japan relations. Mother, lawyer, writer. Kennedy is a competent, successful woman who is also the daughter of a legendary U.S. president. Her term as ambassador to Japan will be one of the most watched and analyzed ever.